everyone. I am delighted to have Nathan back on the podcast to speak about Henry VII. Um, he is the go-to, I think, on Henry VII and all of the Beaufort descendants. But in this case, we're going to be particularly looking at what I think is one of the most successful, possibly the most successful Tudor royal marriage, which is Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. Starts out purely political, but I think ends much better. So welcome, Nathan, and thank you so much for joining us. No problems. Thank you very much for having me. Well, I, I want to start with the sort of the beginnings or the first thoughts about this um, uh, Lancaster and York, Lancaster Beaufort and York, Tudor and York reunion or, or marriage. And I've read that it had its beginnings in the two mothers that Elizabeth Woodville and Margaret Beaufort um, sort of dreamt up this idea. Do you think that's right? Uh, yeah, I think it's fair to say that is the, the real origins of this union between uh, Henry Tudor and Elizabeth of York. Um, at the time, 1483, you know, Henry Tudor had been exiled for more than a decade at this point, and it had been it had been moved a couple of years prior to this. Now, one of the ways of getting Henry back to England so that he could, um, you know, enter his his rightful inheritance as the Earl of Richmond right. was perhaps to marry one of the York daughters. Uh, this is what Margaret Beaufort, uh, prop you know, proposed to Edward IV: Let my son come back to England let him become an earl, and perhaps you can marry one of your daughters, one of your, your five daughters. Um, you know, this plan didn't quite take off. Uh, just at the moment that Margaret seemed to be getting somewhere with Edward IV, Edward IV went and died. <laughs> uh, Richard, Richard III became king. Uh, however, that may have happened. Uh, Richard, <laughs> R Richard becomes king, and uh, the deal is off. You know, it seems that Richard... Uh, doesn't want Henry to come back to England. You know, why would he? He's a he's a potential threat to Richard. Richard's uneasy on the crown. He needs to secure his own position at the moment. So it does seem that by the time we get to 1483, Henry is not coming back to England. There's no hope for him to return to become Earl of Richmond. It is at this point that Margaret Beaufort does seem to to enter discussions with Elizabeth Woodville. Uh, you know, into possibly arranging a marriage between their two children. And it does make some degree of sense. You know, Margaret Beaufort's got no hope here, really, of getting her son back to England. She needs to do something drastic. Um, Elizabeth Woodville, of course, has, has fled into sanctuary. Her husband's died. Um, Richard III has taken the throne, her brother-in-law, and he's also taken control of her son, uh, Edward V. He's also now taking control of a second son, mm -hmm. you know, and the boys, the princes of the tower, have disappeared beyond the bars of the tower, never to be seen again. So Elizabeth Woodville is in a tricky situation as well. You know, she needs a... In sport, we would call her Hail Mary Pass. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I, I don't know if you if, if, if you guys in America have, have the same phrase, or perhaps we've taken it from America. Not, <laughs> I, I have sure. heard that several times, so yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we must have, we must have stolen it from America. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's very much a Hail Mary pass from Elizabeth Woodfill. She's got nothing to lose. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, fortuitously, Margaret Beaufort and Elizabeth Woodfill share the same doctor, mm -hmm. uh, a Welshman called Lewis Callion. So Lewis Callion is basically, he's the only person who can go in and out of Westminster Abbey to meet with Elizabeth Woodfill without Richard III's guards stopping him. Mm -hmm. So Margaret very cleverly sending his message in to Elizabeth. Uh, hey, why don't you, you know, hook up your daughter with my son, <laughs> get them together, and together we can we can banish Richard III to the depths of hell. Uh, and of course, you know that is essentially what happens. We have to we have to assume that at this point Elizabeth Woodfill believes. Her two boys are dead because there's no real reason why she would favor this match. 
and the potential of Henry Tudor becoming king of England if she didn't believe, rightly or wrongly, that her two boys are dead. Um, but it is definitely, you know, even if there had been uh, murmurings in the past uh, between Margaret Beaufort and Edward IV, there was nothing really serious okay. at that stage. So I think, yes, I think it is a fair statement to say this all stems in the summer of 1483, Henry Tudor and Elizabeth uh, of York's potential marriage is arranged by their, their mothers. And it's all just a, a combined anti ricardian movement, ultimately. You know, Margaret Beaufort has been quite, quite shrewd in, in right. spotting the potential here, you know. The one thing we have to be clear is that there's certainly no evidence whatsoever we can ever suggest that Margaret Beaufort had these long-term designs on her son becoming King of England. You know, that is pure fantasy right. taken from fiction work. The earliest Margaret Beaufort believes that her son, Henry Tudor, can become King of England is the summer of 1483, and that's simply because of what Richard III did. But she's very quick to uh right. Very quick to snap into action in fourteen eighty three. Right. right. And then Henry himself, while he's still in exile on that Christmas service, right? He declares he's going to do it. So he's on board. What about Elizabeth of York? Because there are rumors that she wasn't on board or that Richard himself wanted to marry her or she wanted to marry him. What about that? Is there any truth to that? You know, this is quite an interesting uh, period because you're correct. In Christmas 1483, Henry Tudor is a, you know, essentially a bit of a nobody. Um, and he, the, the, the only way Henry Tudor can become king is through the support of all of those Yorkists who do not support what Richard III did. Right. You know, we could, let's call them the Edwardian Yorkists, just to differentiate them from yeah. the Ricardian Yorkists. But the only way Henry can possibly get them on side is through this marriage idea with Elizabeth of York. Right. And yeah, he, he, he buys into it because he needs to, you know. Right. Um, so Christmas, Christmas Day, 1483, he pledges this oath between these Yorkist men and he says, I will marry Elizabeth if you support me. And of course, they will support him mm -hmm. because of who he's married to. So this is all all well and good. Um, now, fast forward a couple of months later, um, you know, you know, as we know from the Chronicles, Richard III's wife, Anne Neville, dies. Right. And he does he does need to remarry pretty sharpish, you know. I don't want to get too far down a, a Ricardian argument, but there is an element of later... Uh, maligning Richard III's um, motivations at this time. My reading of the history, different historians will have different readings, but my readings of history are that Richard, whilst he did truly grieve the death of his wife, yeah. um, that, that seems clear from, from, the, from the Chronicles, dynastically he had to remarry. He had no son right. at this point. He had no right. wife. He had to marry. Now, one of the Chronicles suggests that he had his eye on his niece Elizabeth of York. I think that's I think that's nonsense. I think there's no way he would have been able to have uh, got away with it. There's no way he would have been able to get the dispensation. And right. in truth, he was negotiating a marriage for himself with uh, the Portuguese royal family. Right. Which is interesting, again, in itself, because the Portuguese were descended from the Lancastrians. Yes. Uh, they were descended from John of Gaunt. So, yeah. Richard's almost trying to outflank Henry Tudor and his Union of the Roses type of mm -hmm. strategy to do his own mm -hmm. uh, Union of the Roses. Now, the problem Richard has is that I do not believe that he wanted or he even considered marrying Elizabeth of York, but enough people in London at the time believed it, right. they had to formally declare they had no interest. You know, this is very... This shows that regardless of what... Ricardian revisionists might want to say that Richard's reputation was only blackened after his death. It's clearly blackened during his own reign that he had to right. formally say, I do not want to marry my niece. Elizabeth of York, you know, there's no way that she would have been open to this because I don't even think it was on the table for her to even um, query it. We do get a later, I think it's the early 1700s or 1600s, we get a, an apparent letter that this Ricardian mm -hmm. revisionist author named George Buck has found 
about Elizabeth of York being a bit of a lovesick teenager for Uncle Richard, yet he's the only person who ever saw this document. Right. This doesn't exist. I'm going to put that down to very questionable historical evidence. Um, bottom line, I don't think the plan was on the table. Therefore, Richard did not want to marry his niece. Elizabeth, it wasn't even an option for her. I think it is just a black rumour going around at the time. But it is a rumour that did spread to uh, France, where Henry mm-hmm. Tudor was. And it was a rumour that we're told by his by his official biographer later that it, quote, pinched him by the very stomach because he knew if this was true and mm-hmm. if he lost the marriage, then his whole plan completely falls apart because all of the Yorkists who support him would not support him without Elizabeth being his wife. Um mm-hmm. So it's it's very much this kind of back and forth cold war going on in 1484. A lot of rumor, right? Um, and you know, sometimes rumor is just founded on very little, but it does have huge consequences. Right, um, right. And and Henry was very aware of what that meant. And Elizabeth herself probably assumed if you were, you know, a king's daughter, she at the moment was considered illegitimate because of Richard's plan, but still she would have probably planned on an arranged marriage, not with Richard, but anyway, so. Yeah, I mean, the suggestion seems to be Richard was also arranged for her to marry into the Portuguese royal family as well, you know, marry her off to, to, to a random Portuguese duke, mm-hmm. um, and, and she's removed effectively from, from the question. Uh, he was also planning to marry her younger sisters off to just men of minor rank, which is exactly what Henry would do when he yeah. becomes king. Henry married all of the York princesses mm-hmm. off to really close supporters of his, but right. men of very low to negligible rank. You know, he they basically just got filtered down, you know, the blood was filtered down to a point yeah. where they were never going to come back and be able to launch a, an right. attack. That's the, the strategic thing to do yeah. because they are the Yorkist princesses. Yeah, right. and, and and Henry would have uh, Richard the Third would have done exactly the same thing. I mean, Ricardian yeah. Ricard, modern Ricardians can always criticise what Henry did, but they can only do that from a position of that Richard never got the chance to put his own plans in action, and his right. own plans would have they would have followed a very similar path because that's just how history would have unfolded. Right, that that's what you had to do to keep the throne. You had to get you know uh, and, yeah yeah. All right. Uh, what, what what I say about Richard the Third is. Uh, you know, not, not to get into a Princess of the Tower discussion, but I always feel the fact that he, I think he killed the Princess of the Tower because he needed to be a bad uncle to be a good father. Because at the time the princess yeah. disappeared, he only had to be concerned with his son's his son. future. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough decision, but selfishness is the, is the path to success for these medieval kings. Well, right. I mean, this was a time when that's how you got the throne and then held the throne for your son and to protect your son is you eliminate his competition. So absolutely, abs- definitely. Okay, so I'm on board with you there. Um, when Henry and Elizabeth were married, Henry had already been crowned. So after Bosworth, and then he predates the reign, and then he has himself crowned separately, just Henry. Then he calls Parliament, reverses all of that. Elizabeth's legitimate again, and then he marries her. But then he doesn't have her coronation until Arthur's born. So there are some delays in fulfilling. Do the Yorkists see it as delays? I shouldn't shouldn't make that call. It appears to me there are some delays in fulfilling that. How is that received by the Yorkists? And is Henry doing that strategically? Does it just happen that way? Um, very clever kingship. Yeah. Um, again, you know, he cannot... When Henry becomes king, I, I think that the Yorkist supporters behind him, they've assumed that they're getting a puppet. He's a complete nobody. He doesn't know England at all. He's right. never even so much as... Um, governed a strip of land, let alone a kingdom. You know, he's never been an earl. Well, he's right. been earl in, by name only, not by, you know, reality. They they think they're getting a puppet. They think they're going to put this little, um, you know, puppet on, on the throne. They're going to rule through him. They don't realise the man that Henry Tudor is. Henry right. Tudor becomes king, and this is a man who's never had anything of his own. So he jealously guards 
his power. Right. He trusts very few people. The the last thing Henry Tudor is going to do from his point of view is come straight in, crown Elizabeth of York, hand over all power to the Yorkists, mm-hmm. and fail to establish his own position. He has to establish his position, and he has to be seen to be a leader uh, where he is the undisputed number one. So first and foremost, Elizabeth's got to take a back seat here. You know, yeah. he's the king. He's not king because of her. He's not, um, He's not. you know, a, a king consort or anything. He is the king. That's it. He can marry whoever he wants. He can do whatever he wants. Um, obviously, he knows he wouldn't be prudent to do that. Yeah. But still, he's got to set out his stall. So the first thing's first, the marriage. Now, this is often considered a delay. It's not really. Um, Henry marries Elizabeth of York on the 8th, off top of my head, I think it's the 18th of January, 1486. He becomes king on the 22nd of August, 1485. Mm-hmm. So this is what, give or take five, six months. He only got a draft of the papal dispensation allowing him to marry two days before they were married. Okay. So, so this idea that Henry's delayed it, if anything, he's, he's married her at the absolute earliest opportunity he could have. He could not have married her before the papal dispensation because he had to make sure that any children they have, there right. was going to be no stains of illegitimacy yeah. and so on. Right. So, so 16th of January, they get the papal disp- or the promise of a papal dispensation even um, from a, a papal legate who's in England at the time. Two days later, he marries her. And it's incredible for a man who was such a showmanship when it came to the great big royal events. Right. We don't have we, we have very little knowledge or evidence of this wedding. It's effectively conducted in private. You know, right. again, it adds to the idea that he just needed to, he just wanted to marry her. He just have to get the marriage done and dusted as soon as possible. And she's instantly pregnant. Right. Um you know, the, so so the marriage itself there's no delay. It is okay. He is he is in there as quickly as possible. But obviously people take that five, six month delay to, to somehow be a um Henry delaying and prevaricating. So, however, he does not crown her as, as we've discussed, right. and that is that is that is the actual okay. big um statement he, he's making. She is, she you knows she is queen just by virtue of being married, but he's not crowning her. She doesn't get crowned until um fourteen eighty seven, and it's very pointedly conducted after the first failure of a rebellion against Henry. Henry mm-hmm. Henry overcomes and defeats the Lambert Simnel uh rebellion, conspiracy, uprising, whatever we want to call it. Uh and clearly there is some some discontent amongst uh his Yorkists or Yorkist right. support. So he very quickly overcomes that by crowning Elizabeth of York and on we go. You know, it is it, probably the first misstep Henry did, but you know, he very quickly corrected it. There right. was there was no real Yorkist rebellion during Henry's reign. And that sounds a bit odd to say when we know about Lambert Simnel, Perkin Warbeck and so on. Right. But but you know, the Yorkist nobility, the Yorkist factions, Yorkist support, they very quickly just become Tudor support. You know, they mm-hmm. they, they, they know which side their bread is buttered and they stay they, they toe the line. Um right. And that's because Henry pretty much made sure that he had he corrected things such as having Elizabeth crowned and, and right. so on. Well, and um, the birth of the birth of Arthur too really solidifies because he's presented the nation so quickly with a male heir, which turns out to be a big problem for the Tudors. But he does it, you know, he proves himself that way very quickly with his wife, and so that's a first big success for them. Yeah, and the big thing Henry has going for him is this concept of divine judgment. Mm-hmm. He's won the crown on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. You know, pe- people take this to be God's message. He yeah. gets instantly an heir is born, Arthur, uh-huh. given this great old famous, you know, wealth mythological name steeped right. in the golden ages of yore. God, God is shining. God is shining yeah. a big light down on Henry and Elizabeth. So that, that in itself is going to quell any significant um revolt against right. Henry. 
you know, it it, it works. It it works. The, the concept of the Union of the Roses and so on. It's a very good, very masterful good propagandic yeah. message. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then and then history seems to be bearing him out because he has the son and things are going well. They continue to have children for living to adulthood, if you consider Arthur's to sort of on the brink of adulthood. But you know, for living children for a royal couple's, you know, two daughters to marry. I mean, it looks really good and an heir and a spare. So that's all good. Now, with there have been there are a couple of rebellions. Do we get any sense of Elizabeth of York? And I know there's some question about Elizabeth Woodville's reaction because in one case they're claiming to be her brother, Elizabeth of York's brother, one of the two princes. So do we see a reaction to that? Not not really. Um Let's take Elizabeth Woodville first of all. So in 1487, there's a rebellion mm-hmm. uh, under Lambert Simnel. Lambert Simnel claims, uh, and his supporters claim him to be Edward, the Earl of Warwick, who's trapped in the tower. Mm-hmm. Now, at this time, Elizabeth Woodville is also removed to Bermondsey Abbey to effectively retire, and her money as a dowager queen is passed on to her daughter, Elizabeth of York. And this has been interpreted to be some sort of distrust of of Elizabeth Woodville. Now, it doesn't really necessarily need to read that way. Uh, Elizabeth Woodville, it does seem that she's removed herself rather than being removed. Right. Um, you know, she's effectively retired and there is now late, quite a, a bit of later evidence that suggests that she was perhaps a bit sick um, and therefore has sought, you know, in those days you go to the Arby's as your, as your hospitals. Mm-hmm. Um, her son, her son from the first marriage, however, Thomas Gray, the Marquess of Dorset. So this is Elizabeth Woodville, Elizabeth of York's older half brother. Right. He's definitely a man of not trusted by Henry Tudor. So d- d- the Marquess of Dorset had joined Henry Tudor in exile in 1483, but he very quickly tried to accept a pardon for Richard III and return home. He mm-hmm. escaped mm-hmm. In, at midnight. Uh, but Henry soldiers caught him and brought him back. And ever since then, Henry never trusted him. He thought he was a bit a, a bit weak in his loyalties. Now, Dorset had also been the Earl of Warwick's guardian years earlier. So when mm-hmm. this Lambert Simnel conspiracy suddenly kicked off, where they were trying to make what, the Earl of Warwick a king, right? Dorset seems to have wavered. Now, okay. the. It makes sense for him perhaps to waver because he could get even more power with Warwick on the throne. He's, you know, he's protege to some extent than his half right. half sister because he's not really getting much power. But Elizabeth Woodfell, I think, in fourteen eighty seven, it's just unfortunate timing that's been misinterpreted. Yeah. Now Elizabeth of York, there is nothing we have or nothing I'm aware of um, mm-hmm. that suggests what her feelings were on all of this. We obviously have all these fiction interpretations yes, of her right. meeting Perkin Warbeck. So there's no evidence it ever happened. There's no evidence they spoke. I think they possibly would have at least seen each other around court because mm-hmm. contrary to popular belief, when Henry Tudor captured Perkin Warbeck, he actually granted him his life twice and let him live around court for mm-hmm. at least a year. And mm-hmm. he, was free, he was free to move around court the chances are they probably would have uh, glimpsed you to that. But this idea, like, modern people are reading perhaps a lot into their own sibling relationships, and they think, okay. you know, if, if you have your your brother, you're going to love him unconditionally, and you're going to support his rightful claims and so on. But back then, Elizabeth didn't know her younger brother that well. Right. Um, and secondly, by this point, she is a completely fully paid-up member of the Tudor dynasty, you know, right. this, this concept that she's suddenly going to complete disinherit her own children and their own future. Right. For a brother that may, you know, for, for someone who may or may not they be may her not. brother, who she barely knows, who, you know, Perkin Warbeck's character, whether he was a prince or not, is very questionable. Right. Compared to a husband who she's grown to love, who mm-hmm. she has birthed numerous children, who God is shining on. It's, right. It's kind that kind of concept of Elizabeth throwing everything away can only exist in fiction work. Okay. The reality it would never, you know, it would never cross her mind again to to bring the house of Tudor tumbling down 
Right. But she is the House of Tudor. She is the House of Tudor, right. Yeah. And her children are the future of yeah. the House of Tudor. So, yeah. okay. Well, thank you, because I think we do need to mention that because it does kind of crop up in some fiction that people take too seriously. So the first really big personal blow, and they, there had been other children dying young, but they have this great success when Arthur is married to Catherine of Aragon. And we see a big celebration, which, you know, this, this reputation Henry VII has later of being miserly and not spending any money is really belied by this huge celebration when Catherine of Aragon comes and, you know, their marriage, their wedding, everything's really big. And then Arthur dies. And this is a big blow. He's the heir. He's the future. He's Arthur. So he's the reincarnation of the Arthurian legend and all of that. But one of the things that comes out of this are some descriptions of Henry and Elizabeth comforting each other that I think really to me indicate that political marriage has become a real committed marriage. So can you talk a little bit about that and how a political marriage can turn into such a strong bond between these people? I mean, I think there's still quite a lot of misunderstanding about arranged marriages today in the West, you know, there's perhaps an idea that, uh, you know, fa you know, families from certain cultures, they will arrange marriages and it's perhaps considered a bit, um, a bit odd, you know, perhaps a bit weird to, to, to the, to the Westernized world, but these marriages do tend to work. Right. And they do, they do tend to, to ultimately, um, become productive in whatever, you know, means your objective they were set out to do. Often, perhaps children are, are bringing certain families together. You know, they've worked all through history. And, mm -hmm. and it, it does feel a bit surprising that there is this, um, there's still this discussion about, oh, is this such a surprise that Elizabeth <laughs> and, and Henry worked? But again, if this is what humans have done for the majority of, of history, you know, the the, the parents of the parents have, have not taken this decision lightly but right but to, to bring it back to you know basically what, what we want as a modern audience is to, is to see this this loving right kind relationship blossom and, and it, it does you know I, I do think that they loved each other we can only go on the records that we have um there is no record whatsoever of henry tudor having a mistress which is very rare for kings very before him one. and after him i mean just look at the mess that his son left behind um I mean, there's no evidence of that you know pr again perhaps that is um a modern take on it that we you know we, we perhaps as a as a modern audience like to think that uh being faithful is the is the best barometer example of a loving marriage but it is very unusual for mm -hmm. the time that a king and allegedly even Kings and uh, royal consorts up into the last century take mistresses. I mean, not to not to bring it too political, but we just look at our current king. Um, so it is definitely unusual for the fifteenth century for Henry Tudor to not waver, and I think that is a credit to how happy he probably was in in everything that Elizabeth was able to provide him as a companion, as a mother, as a wife, as a queen. Um, you know, she very much does come across as being the the perfect embodiment of what you want from a from a medieval queen. Um, now, obviously, what we've hinted at is the reason, real reason that we we feel that this marriage is, you know, the real deal, is what happens after Arthur dies. Um, right. You know, second of April, fifteen or two, Arthur dies, and the news is carried to Greenwich, where the royal couple are staying. Uh, I think it's considered the most sorrowful and heavy tidings are brought to the king's councillors. Now, the king's councillors are perhaps a bit too scared to convey the news to the king himself. So they send in his personal confessor. And the next morning, uh, Henry and Henry is woken by the kit by the the, the friar, uh, the personal confessor who orders everyone out of the room and turns to the king and says, if we have received good things by the hand of God, why should we not receive evil? And apparently 
Henry immediately understood what this friar was hinting at. She calls for his wife to join him. You know, he doesn't take the news by himself. You know, mm-hmm. you could argue he's a king. Uh, you know, I, I'm guessing, you know, his, his son, Henry VIII, would probably have definitely taken the news himself. You know, he he wasn't he wasn't willing to be a, a, a part of a team with anybody. Right. Uh, but 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 Henry the Seventh, he calls his wife together, and they take the painful sorrows together as a couple. Now, Henry, we're told by this account, took the news very hard. You know, it it destroyed him because everything he had built up and developed, everything had been invested. In mm-hmm. Arthur, mm-hmm. the whole Tudor dynasty is invested in Arthur. When Arthur dies, this is a cruel and bitter blow to the king. Now Elizabeth is the one who comforts him um, with, uh, I think the quotation is with full, great, and constant, comfortable words, and she reminds her husband um, that even though he himself had been an only child, but God had given him great success in his life. Mm-hmm. Whereas the same God had also provided them with multiple children. There was still yeah. another prince mm-hmm. uh, that they had, they have, and they were young enough to have even more children. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, Elizabeth is comforting Henry, and eventually she goes back to her own room. But it's only there when she's in her own room that she suddenly, um, you know, understands the great loss that she herself has now suffered. Right. And she collapses in pain, you know, motherly pain of her lost son. And it's this time it is word is sent to Henry that his wife, you know, has collapsed, so to speak. And he Mm -hmm. rushes to the palace to comfort her this time. Mm -hmm. So we have this remarkable imagery of both of them comforting each other separately uh, as a team, you know, as as a true married couple, um, and it is a very rare glimpse into a private marriage, you know, a private right. royal marriage. Um, it was one conceived through political necessity. Right. Um, but I think, you know, it's developed into a union of trust, mm-hmm. fidelity, and something we would call today love. Right. Right. And I think it's interesting because their children grew up with that. Now, we don't know what Arthur may have been like as a spouse, because I mean, the letter, the initial letters to Catherine of Aragon were very loving and it looked like it was off to a great start, but it only lasted the six months. But Henry VIII and then Margaret and Mary all have their own, Mary not so much, but certainly Henry and Margaret have a lot of problems achieving that success, even set aside happiness, um, success in marriage. So, I just think it's interesting. Do you think that Henry VII and Elizabeth of York created sort of the best? It seems to me that's the most successful marriage. They produce multiple children, including two sons. It just seems like that they get it right and it doesn't happen again. Yeah, I I mean, I'm I'm not a psychologist uh, and so on, but like I think it was David Starkey who years ago said something like Henry VIII was always trying to replicate his mother Mm. In in trying to find like the perfect woman and the perfect marriage, and he never quite got there. You know, again, if if he would have been able to attend modern modern psychologists and so on, they would have probably had an absolute field day with him. But there is an element of they had perfection, and their children perhaps struggled to um to to measure up to measure compared that. to what was quite a unique scenario. And I, I'm sure there's plenty of marriage is all around us in the modern world where right a, a, a parents seem to have a perfect marriage and the the children struggle um but i mean just just going back a step just obviously we've just covered the death of arthur mm-hmm. and elizabeth does get pregnant soon afterwards but she dies right. in in childbirth and it's this again that really shines a light on their marriage because if henry had been shaken by arthur's death then it was elizabeth's death that really completely and utterly destroyed him. I mean, right. he physically and mentally collapsed. Um, yes. Apparently, after the death of his Elizabeth, he just quickly passed on word, you know, he issued commands for a funeral, and then he went and spent the next couple of weeks in a private room 
when nobody was able to approach him. You know, it, it's basically a, uh, it, it's it's a phys- it's a mental collapse. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's utter grief in in darkness. Um, and I think it's after this we always hear that you know Henry Henry the Seventh was a was a, was a uh, an oppressive king, uh, you know, a dark king, and he used finance to to crush his subjects. Mm-hmm. This all only really accelerates after the death of his wife, when he does finally emerge from his, you know, from his private dungeon. He's altogether a much more harder and colder king that emerged. But mm-hmm. there is one little, um, one little insight that I do think reveals a lot about Henry's reaction to Elizabeth's death. And that is Elizabeth died in the Tower of London, you know, the, probably the most important royal fortress in the kingdom, mm-hmm. 400 years symbolic of, of English crown supremacy and so on. Right. Henry, Henry never goes back to the Tower of London for the rest of his life. During the right. seven years he still lives and reigns, he abandons the Tower of London as a royal palace. He never goes back. And I think it's it's too painful to him yeah. to be there. You know, this is not the normal reaction of medieval kings who right. just get on with it. Um, Henry doesn't get on with it. Henry right. completely collapses. Um, certainly, again, he's not doing what his son goes on to do. No. Which is, uh, what, what, what is he with Jane Seymour? Is it like nine days after... And the Boleyn's execution, he's already uh-huh. Uh-huh. patrolled. You know, he's he's definitely not his son was made of completely different, yes. different things, wasn't he? Yes, yes. And and even after the death of Jane Seymour, Henry the Eighth was looking to marry again. And I realized there were some thoughts that Henry the Seventh would marry again. Why do you think he didn't? Um it's just timing. I mean, Henry was Henry was sick in the last seven years of his, years of his life. Um, right. After his wife dies, he never he never recovers physically. Uh, yeah. He 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 is deathly ill for many years uh, successively before he does finally die. About three years later, he does start to look at potentially marrying, and for some reason, this has been taken as again as a bit of a a slur in his reputation. How dare he! He remarry, you know. He must not have loved his wife enough. Well, that's people talking from a from a vantage point that they have no personal experience of, and it's just right. it's just nonsense. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, regardless of him as a man, perhaps looking to find comfort uh, and uh, become reinvigorated, uh, it's just dynastically important. Right. He, ha- he has to remarry. He's only got mm-hmm. one son left. Mm-hmm. It's no different to Richard III than all previous kings. He has to remarry at this point right. to try and get some more sons. That he doesn't, one interpretation can be that his heart really wasn't in it. When it came down to it, um, you know, he was pushing, you know, mid-40s at this point. Mm-hmm. His heart wasn't in it because of Elizabeth. Um, our, you know, a more unfavourable... Uh, interpretation will be simply that he was too old and he was too sick and time had passed him by, you know. But mm-hmm. he, he doesn't remarry. And again, there's no evidence of mistresses. There's no evidence of him taking anyone else um, mm-hmm. to, to his bedchamber or whatever. And I think it just all, it all does add to this overriding concept of it was the most successful royal marriage, you know, politically and personally. Right. That uh, um England's and uh, Britain's seen. You know, people consider the recent Queen and mm-hmm. uh Prince Philip to be an incredibly strong and devoted marriage. This would have been right. The medieval equivalent. Okay. Well and that's a good comparison because they really did at the end count on each other. And she seems to be in a very tight circle of few people that he trusted, he trusted her and that loss was huge. Yeah. So um, so then I just want to sort of circle back to Margaret Beaufort because she's the one that sort of started this, you know, had this idea. And at the end of Henry's life, she is still alive. I mean, she's really remarkable having lived through all these kings and lives to see Henry VIII take the throne and all of that. So is Margaret taking on some of that 
consort role in the end, in the final years of Henry VII's life? Is she sort of the figure who fulfills some of that? Or is um, that not there during the end of his life? No, I think it's just a a, a gap, really. You know, okay. the, the mis the misunderstanding of Margaret Beaufort is that she's always considered to be like this this dragon lady who stood next to her son throughout the reign. Margaret retires mm -hmm. from court, you know, around about late fourteen hundreds. You know, her son's securing the throne, and she retreats to her own estates in Northamptonshire to just get on with her own life as a you know, as a, as a wealthy landowner, right? Um, overlooking her own estates. You know, she's there. She 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 writes to her son and so on, but she's not really present. She does come back to court right towards the end because mm -hmm. you know her, her son's dying. She needs to be there. But um, I I wouldn't have necessarily have said that she assumed the consort role. You know, she she was certainly present at all at all of the big events of the of this first two to reign. Uh, people like to try and put in competition with Elizabeth, but Elizabeth right. always had precedence. Uh -huh. uh, you know, Margaret Margaret considered herself to be a princess. Uh, mm -hmm. She considered, you know, she was the, my lady, the queen mother, but mm -hmm. she, she didn't outrank Elizabeth in any way, and I wouldn't have said that she would necessarily have replaced her, but um, that's probably that's probably a question for the more um, the more experienced and detailed, I think, royal... Um, Academics um, <laughs> to, 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 to chase up because um you know it's some fantastic work by by like you know like a a, a a historian called Joanna Lane Smith who who works very closely in analyzing the royal ladies of the early Tudor reign and her okay. her books are her books are fantastic on this kind of the very intricate details of of um pageantry and um, okay rank um but i mean my my reading is no i think you know margaret just simply isn't there enough to to have inhabited such a such a role to write to there when she came back to court to try and uh finesse some of the details around her son's death right. and of course the succession yeah okay so she steps in sort of for that well that's good because and you mentioned um that there are attempts to make these two women into competitors and which just doesn't seem to fit the history we have. The, the thing is, right, Margaret Beaufort had known Elizabeth since she was a little girl. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she'd known this woman for pretty much all of her life. And much has been made of this supposed uh, enmity between mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. And it's based on very, very little. Uh, in fact, it's based on two reports made by a Spanish ambassador in 1498 so you know the, the the english court at this time has always got ambassadors there observing and writing home mm -hmm. and in spain uh, sorry in england in 1498 there were quite a few spanish ambassadors because we have two visiting spanish ambassadors to england um and we also have the spanish ambassador to scotland who happened to be in london at this time visiting himself now this uh, Spanish slash Scottish ambassador, he doesn't like Henry Tudor. He doesn't like the English. You know, he's loyal to the Scottish. Right. And he's and, and he's reporting home from his own prejudiced um viewpoint. And he also has a bit of a bit of beef with the other Spanish ambassadors. They all hate each other. <laughs> um so, so you know as always context is context right. is king when we're we're talking about this. But this Spanish ambassador he had arrived in in London two weeks earlier, um, and he simply says um, the the Queen Elizabeth is uh, she's a very noble woman, she's much beloved by the people, but she's kept in subjection by the mother of the king. But he doesn't say what that means. He doesn't uh -huh. say um, anything else about that. And then a month later, another Spanish ambassador to Scotland mentions that Henry is very much influenced by his mother and the Queen does not like it. So these are the two one-line quotes we have written by mm -hmm. two visitors to England in 1498. Now, it could be complete, it could be a completely accurate um summation of the entire relationship. However, we would surely have heard something else during the 30 years these two were uh -huh. 
by each other's side. There would have been some right. other notice of that they didn't like each other. The other evidence you have is that they worked completely in tandem with each other throughout the reign. Right. Um, you know, they, they, they were close when it comes to the birth of the children. They were close yes. um, in supporting Henry, you know, that their, their mm-hmm. common mm-hmm. objective. Right. And I also, I also think that these courts could have just come at a particularly uh, tough time in July 1498, you know, we're coming off the back of a rebellion. It's a stressful period. Right. Um, it hasn't been long since one of Elizabeth's children have died. And she right. was, in fact, pregnant at this time. Now, not to get too much into, you know, 1970s stereotypical uh, humour, but most people have had problems with their mother-in-law in the past. You know, these are, these are close relationships <laughs> and the small, you know, just small issues here and there. It happens. It's human nature. Right, Ma- El- Elizabeth's pregnant. It's a, it's an intense time. Intense time, yeah. Margaret's there. There's just perhaps a look or a comment mm-hmm. has happened to be observed by a Spanish, a hostile Spanish ambassador who's then recorded it for all posterity. Right. But the the, the the fact of what I'm just trying to say is that this entire idea of this horrid relationship between Margaret both and Elizabeth of York comes from one line. It's it's absurd yeah. that so much has been made right. from so little. And there's no other evidence in 30 years. And to be honest, if that's the only time they seem to have had a bit of a, a you know, a bit of a, a one-hour falling out, then that's a right. pretty good relationship. That's pretty good, out. right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and with other records that were made by people who maybe didn't resent Henry or didn't resent, you know, those those ambassadors had their own agenda too. Absolutely. The, the, you know, they, they were trying to tarnish mm-hmm. Henry's, let's say we got, somebody needs to do a, to, to do some work on the Spanish ambassadors because, you know, you, again, you had you had the, the, the Spanish ambassador to, to England, the Spanish ambassador to Spain, and you had another Spanish ambassador to England, another Spanish ambassador to Scotland, sorry. Mm-hmm. And they just... They just hated each other. They would write home to the to the to the Spanish king, complaining about each other. And one of them, <laughs> one of them loved Henry. And yes, you know that is in itself prejudicial mm-hmm. uh, evidence we have because you know they make Henry out to be some sort of uh, legend. You know <laughs> Henry's wonderful. Henry's this. The other one hates him. You know it, it's all <laughs> evidence, but everything is is prejudiced, right? you know, readings and I, yeah, I just, I just think that in the light of other evidence, other criticisms, I think we have to view this one report in July, 1498 with a, a lot more skepticism than most people right. haven't been given it, you know? Yeah. Um, because there is evidence of the two women working together. And I know when princess Margaret is going to be sent to Scotland, you definitely see Elizabeth and Margaret Beaufort working together because they don't want to send her quite yet and they want to, you know, have her be a little older and they are working uh, together then. And Margaret is very close to Elizabeth's sister, Cecily. Mm-hmm. You know, she, she almost treats her like a, you know, like a daughter of her own. You know, Margaret is very protective. She's very mm-hmm. loving. And there is an occasion, in fact, where Margaret and Elizabeth work closely um, to change the king's mind. And this is around about... 1495, 1496 time where Henry wants to marry his daughter mm-hmm. to the Scottish king and send her right. north at 12 years old. And right. Margaret says no. Yeah. She knows what happens if this if she goes to the barbarian Scots. She's not having it. And Elizabeth comes in and says, I don't want my little girl to go up there either. Mm-hmm. And they do change the king's mind. The king goes, right. okay. Um, and in fact, the daughter doesn't go till after. Um, after her mother Elizabeth's death in fifteen oh three, when she does right. go to Scotland at the age of um uh, fifteen, but yeah, twelve yeah. years old, Margaret yeah. said no, Elizabeth said no, and they work together. You know, they, they work they together for the king. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good thing to see, and that that needs to be given more, you know, more light, um, more emphasis. Okay, that's great. Thank you for, I I think clearing that up because I I do think, and I think it's unfortunate you often find that there can't be two women and one man. They have to be in competition. And I don't think that's true. So I appreciate that. So now if you were overall to sort of look at that marriage between Elizabeth and Henry in terms of launching the dynasty, 
right? I mean, it really does launch the dynasty. Um, and you and I've talked before about how Henry the Seventh does end the Wars of the Roses, but not until the end of his reign, right? That's really when it's over. Do you think the marriage was successful in ending the Wars of the Roses, getting to that point and launching the dynasty? Does it really depend on that marriage? How important that mar is that marriage in the whole Tudor story? Um, well, I always say that Henry the Seventh, Henry Tudor, Henry of Richmond, whatever name we want to give him, he never becomes king without Richard the Third taking the crown. That's first and foremost, you know. Okay. Uh, Rich, Richard the Third makes the Tudors. You know, <laughs> put that put that as the as the headline. Okay. Um, but equally, it's as an accurate saying that Henry the Seventh does not become king of England without Elizabeth of York. If if he's not of the right age. Uh, you know, the right gender, the right, uh, he's unmarried, he's in the mm -hmm. right place at the right time. And there's also a Yorkish princess of the right age, unmarried. Mm -hmm. If that match is not put together, Henry wouldn't even have an army. He wouldn't be able to leave France in the first place. But his army, his army is, is a core of 500 English exiles mm -hmm. who are Yorkists, a handful of Lancastrians at best. Uh, yeah. His uncle Jasper Tudor, mm -hmm. John De Vere, the Earl of Ox uh, Earl of Oxford. There's not many other Lancastrians left, right. and then this this this, this little close knit community is bonded together, literally only through the promise that Henry Tudor marries Elizabeth of York, right. and then this 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 uh, exiled community of five hundred is able to get three thousand extra soldiers from mm -hmm. from um from from France. It doesn't happen without that simple promise. It doesn't happen on Christmas Day, 1483, in Wren Cathedral in mm -hmm. Brittany. Henry Tudor promising to my Elizabeth of York. That is the start of the end of the Wars of the Roses. Um, okay. And people can criticise this idea that Henry didn't end the Wars of the Roses because of all the rebellions and because of this, and it's all Shakespeare. It's just nonsense. The Wars <laughs> of the Roses ends. You know, 1509, the Wars of the Roses is over. What happens at then after Henry and other things uh, under Henry VIII, that is, that's a different phase we've moved into. That's not, right. yes, there's one or two people still around to claim Yorkist ancestry, but the idea of wars between right. rivals, you know, those are just revolts for different martyrs at that point. Uh, right. You know, the Wars of the Roses has ended through this union, uh, not, as we've discussed, we're not at the outset of the reign, but certainly at the end of the reign, mm -hmm. when the true inheritor of red and white right. takes the throne. Um, it wasn't Arthur, uh, unfortunately, I'll probably say. It was little little Prince Henry, but there we go. You know, the objective from this royal marriage, there was one objective at the start, and mm -hmm. however they got to the end, objective complete. And that's more than can be said of for Richard III, Edward IV, Henry VI, yeah. uh, Henry V, all right. the way back to... Um, perhaps Edward III was probably the last king of England who really was able to leave a lasting legacy. And even then, with his five sons, he caused the Wars of the Roses. So. Yeah, because because it's little yeah. boy Richard II who takes the throne. Yeah, so that that's a really great way to think about it. He absolutely, the two of them, Henry and Elizabeth, absolutely succeed as Henry VIII comes to the throne is the obvious choice, uncontested, and it's done. So. And it works. It works perfectly because there's also, you know, there's a criticism of Henry that he leaves Elizabeth to, you know, to just get on with the with the stereotypical role of just being a mother. You know, he's always kept kept her indoors, as, as you know, people would say today in a misogynistic way. And it's also taken as a criticism of him that he hasn't allowed Elizabeth to have any power, to share in power. But no one's been able to put forward any evidence that she wanted to take power. You know, the, the reason it's a good teamwork is because they both played their parts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, H Henry dealt with what he was good at, which is leadership. It's mm -hmm. it's accountancy. It's strategy. You know, it's not a crit. Doesn't need to be a criticism of Elizabeth of Wood, uh, Elizabeth of York, that right. she looked after the nursery, that she took care of uh, the court. You know, she was heavily mm -hmm. in charge of. Of, of the court machinery, right. um, there's nothing to suggest that she herself even wanted power. You know, it's 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 an odd assertion that she was 
kept in subjection by Henry the Seventh. You know, it's a perfect right. team. They played their roles, and and her role was just as important because it was those children in the nursery who grew up to be the King of England and the Queen of Scotland and the Queen of France at different Absolutely. times. Absolutely, you know, that was a pretty important job. And you're right; it was a team that worked, and yeah. And he valued what she was doing. That was clear. So we shouldn't read ourselves onto that story with different expectations. So that's a that's a great way of putting it. So this was um, a really successful, uh, you know, marriage that really did launch this new dynasty and they did it together. So I think that's an important way to leave that. All right. So thank you. And tell us what you're up to these days and where we can find you and what are you working on? There's a new book, right? Uh, yes, I'm working on a book that's tentatively called The Son of Prophecy. And it's about the story of the Welsh Tudors. So it's essentially, I've written the House of Beaufort and how Henry Tudor gets to Bosworth from mm -hmm. the Beaufort side. It's basically the other side, the Welsh Tudors, okay, where they came right. from and how, how do we get to to Bosworth. So it, it, in effect, I will be completing an unofficial trilogy, it seems, <laughs> of the Beauforts, the Welsh Tudors, and I've already done the Henry the Seventh and the Pretenders. So it's right. it's a bit of a, an unofficial trilogy in the making. Fingers crossed I finish it this right. year. But right. I am slow I am slow at working. So <laughs> hopefully one day it, it sees the world. But in the meantime, Instagram, Nathan Amin, Twitter, okay. Nathan Amin. Mm -hmm. wherever Nathan I mean I'm out there okay well we not, will I'm, I'm out there not writing my book <laughs> uh, so I'll, we'll all go on follow your social media and tell you to go yeah. back to work writing so because we want that book well and I will have all those links in the show notes so we can keep following you so thank you so much I really always enjoy talking to you about Henry the seventh and as you say you know pretty unlikely king and definitely um, got there with the support of Elizabeth. It was just a really terrific union. And to see this really working relationship, doing a pretty amazing thing. We, we all know the Tudors, they're famous. They're always in the movies or whatever, but it was a tough start. <laughs> it was kind of an against the odds start of a dynasty. And I think if we do want to just uh, point out the ultimate success of this union is that their direct descendants still sit on the British throne today, you know, and yeah. every single monarch that came after them was directly descended from this union. Yeah, that's true. So they forever, well, at least through today, um, through the monarchy have, have made their mark. So thank you so much for being here and taking us through that. Thank you everyone for listening and watching. Um, and a special thank you, Nathan, for being on camera as well. And we will see you again soon. Thank you.